Reading is from the Gospel of John in chapter 6, verses 30 through 40. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the man in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet... You do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should, not, I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. This is the word of the Lord. All right, you guys can have a seat. Uh, good morning. Uh, my, my name is R.C. Ford. I'm the campus pastor here. If I've not uh, introduced myself, I'm glad to uh, be here with you guys today. Open up to your Bibles um, in that passage in John 6. Um, that's where we'll be today. Uh, again, Christmas is next week, um, Sunday morning. I know Nick kind of gave an announcement about that, but I'm excited about that. I hope you come uh, that day. It's a family service, kids, all these things that we do. It's a very special uh, Lord's Day for us. And so I'm excited about that. Um, one of my favorite Christmas movies um, of all time is The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, this masterpiece uh, based upon the novel of C.S. Lewis. Um, And and so you might say, well, that's not really a Christmas movie. Um, In reality, Christmas is all over the story of Chronicles of Narnia. C.S. Lewis has this genius ability to weave biblical truths within tales uh, he has this ability to uh, tell the story that can marvel the mature, but it can find that a child can even grasp it, right? And so he has this great ability to do that. The story, the Chronicles of Narnia, you're probably familiar with it, but you have these four children um, who enter into this magical land of Narnia through the uh, wardrobe of a professor's home. And upon in, getting into Narnia, uh, they are just in awe and wonder at Narnia. They believe it's just beautiful. It's this land of adventure. But after a little bit, they eventually find out that Narnia is a very unhappy place. It is a, a land uh, that has, was once beautiful, but it's now fallen under the curse of a wicked white witch um, winter never ends there, and they haven't had a Christmas in over 100 years. And all of the Nardians are in jeopardy of losing their hope. Um, well, the children meet up with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, um, and they're having a meal in their home. And, and Mrs. Beaver says to the children, we have reason for hope. We have a, a lot of reasons for hope. And Mr. Beaver interrupts her in the middle of her spill and says, there's a lot more than that. There's Aslan. Aslan has been away for a while, but Aslan is on the move. Aslan is the rightful king of Narnia. And he says this, when Aslan returns, wrong will be Right when Aslan comes to sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. Christians understand, should understand, what it feels like to live in Narnia, a land where evil seems to triumph everywhere, a land where Bad is now called good, and good is now called bad. 
a land where sin and suffering is everywhere, a land where death and darkness is all around us. Life could feel for us like a hundred year winter where Christmas is never going to come. It could leave us very hopeless. But no matter how dark it is in the world, and no matter how dark it is in your world today, or will be in your world one day, no matter how dark it may seem, there is reason for hope. A lot of hope. But a lot more than that, there's God. God is on the move. Over 2,000 years ago, he stepped out of heaven in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the rightful king of the world. And when he comes, he will make everything right when he comes into our sight. When we hear his roar, sorrow and sin will be no more. This is the story of Christmas. <laughs> this is why we can behold our hope in Christ. And so today we're going to be talking about hope, obviously. And I think it's important before we just dive in to talk about hope for just a moment. Um, God has wired us to be hopeful creatures. It's, it's in our DNA. We're hardwired for it. And um, our nature is, is to look forward to good things especially when we are in a present trial or tribulation. It's important for us to look forward to things that will give us joy and peace and strength in the middle of those things, right? That's, we're, we're long that way. We, we all are wired that way. Hope is the thing that keeps you going when your life just seems to be going nowhere or when your life is going in the wrong direction. Hope is the thing that you cling to when it feels like you're losing everything, like your health, your spouse, your family, or uh, a lost loved one. It's the thing you cling to in the middle of those places. Hope is a spark that's inside of you that says tomorrow will be better. Hope is a light at the end of the tunnel where we say, in the end, everything will be okay. The writer of Hebrews calls hope the anchor of a Christian life because it's, it is our stability. Now, in the absence of hope, existence seems meaningless. If there's nothing to look forward to that is good, what's the purpose of life? It's a terrible thing to live without hope. It's a tragic thing to live without hope. But God never intended for us to live on this earth and live the Christian life without hope. When the Bible uses this word, hope, over 200 times, it never uses it uh, the way that we kind of use it in the English language, uh, wishful thinking, optimism, right? It's uncertainty. The Bible doesn't use that word in, uh, in regards to the scriptures um, like this. It's not this. It's not like I hope that I get a big Christmas bonus this year. I hope that um, I'll get all of the presents that I asked for on my list, or I hope the children will sleep through the night. <laughs> not that kind of hope. Not the, the hope that is just this, um, you know, I hope the interest rates drop in Smyrna so I can buy a house one day. Not that kind of hope. Not finger-crossing hope when the Titans are down by two, kicking a field goal with 10 seconds to go. Not that kind of hope. Not the hope that says, I hope RC ends on time today so I can get out of here. Um, that's wishful thinking, right? We know that. I think it's good to talk about what biblical hope actually is. So I've got this definition of it up here. I hope it helps. Pardon the pun there. Here we go. Biblical hope is a confident expectation of a coming good based upon the person and the promises of God. Coming confident expectation of a coming good based upon the 
person and promises of God. Now, that's my definition. I didn't pull that verbatim from Scripture, but I do want you to know something. Apart from that, there is no hope in the world. Apart from that hope right there, there is nothing in this world that can give you hope. Our only hope is in God. A confidence of a coming good from God. And I think today that our passage of scripture that I've read up top, I believe that this passage gives us that. I believe that John 6, this this verses 30 through 40 we're going to talk about today, I think this passage is going to give us great evidence, a reason why you and I today can have this confident expectation of a coming good based upon the person and the promises of God. I think, we can, I think we can hear it and see it in here. This passage of Scripture, really in verses 30 through 40, is a study of salvation, uh, soteriology, uh, a study of how God saves sinners. I will say it like that. Uh, a story of how God's purposes of salvation are accomplished in the world. And this passage, these 10 verses, they're broken up in two different ways. Uh, Verses 36 through, uh, actually 30 through 36, so the first half, think of it like this. It is God's giving of this gift of his son to people and their responsibility to believe. That's the first picture there. The second picture of it is, is God giving a gift of his son to his own people. They do believe and they are kept forever. Um, I'll, say it, I'll say it probably like this. When it comes to the study of salvation, there are two trains of thoughts. Um, there's the thought of God's salvation is man's responsibility or God's Salvation is God's sovereignty. It's his responsibility. He's doing all of those things. And so here's how we're going to look at this. Let me see if I can clarify what we're going to see. In verses 30 through 36, we're going to look at the side of if you believe it's man's responsibility for salvation. Over here in verse 37 through 40, we're going to see God's security, his salvation to save his own. And his purposes never, ever fail. So I think at the end of this, when you and I both look as Christians today at what happens, how God saves, how it started, how it goes on, and how it ends, I think this is how we're going to feel this confident expectation of a coming good based upon Jesus. That's what we're going to look at today. So let's look at the first one. This is in part one, John six thirty through 36. And so it says this, so they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All right, so here's the scene. You have this crowd of people who have followed Jesus across the sea because he had filled their bellies with free bread. And guess what? They're hungry again. They want to come to Jesus because they want this bread, right? And and Jesus says, you need to believe in me. And I'm going to paraphrase this, by the way. And so they say, hey, we'll believe in you, Jesus, if you keep working these miracles. If you keep dancing for us and if you keep doing signs and you keep doing wonders and you keep giving us this free bread, then we'll believe Jesus. And so Jesus, what he does is he redirects them. He says, you got the wrong bread. 
there's a bread, heaven bread, that wells up to eternal life. You need this bread, the real bread. And they're like, I want that bread. And he says, I'm the bread. I'm the bakery and the bread. All who come to me will never be hungry and never thirsty again. Jesus is offering the soul's bread and the soul's drink to them. That's all they got to do. Believe. Come to me. And they would never be hungry and thirsty again. But look what happens here. Think of, it, think of it this way. God is offering his bread. God is offering his son to his own people. And they reject it. They don't believe. They don't come to Jesus. That's what verse 36 says. This is the way that the saving purposes of God looks from the side of man and his responsibility and salvation. This is natural, unaided man. He hears this, I need soul bread, I need soul drink, I need Jesus, he's the bread, but I don't believe, and I don't come to him. Why? Why don't these people believe? They've seen the wonders, they've seen all, why don't they believe? Why is it that people every day in the world don't believe? Why don't don't they reject the bread? The question is this, has God's purposes and salvation failed right here? If his his desire is that this person or that person may be saved and he's offering the gift of his son and then people reject it, has God's purposes failed? Have they failed to save who he's going to save? And if that's the case, How can God be trusted in anything? If he can't even save the people he's going to save or wants to save, then how how can I trust him with my life? How can I trust him to provide for me? How can I trust him to keep me, to guard me? How can I trust him to secure me to the very, very end if he cannot even guarantee me that he's going to save who he's going to save? That's the question. Now, thankfully, he answers the question. And here's the answer. God's purposes in salvation through Christ never, ever fail. They never fail. They never did here, and they never do fail. And we're going to see that here in this text. Now, this passage in verses 37 through 40 is very personal for me. Um. I consider it one of these anchor passages in my life um, that really took my confidence in God to an incredible, entirely new place and a new level. Uh, I often felt like a second awakening um, when I read and I understood this here. Um, it cured me. It cured me of self-confidence and it cured me of self-doubt at the same time. And it provided this anchor uh, for the soul. And I hope it does that for you. Now, let's read it. John 6, 37 through 40. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise him up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. There are five powerful truths of God's sovereign working in our salvation right here that it is very, very important for us to see, to see for yourself, not take my word for this. This is not man's invention here. Um, It's very important that you see this for yourself, um, not as an opinion, because I believe that in these five things, our life, 
our hope and our security will be found in these things. And I also would probably acknowledge too that some of you have been uh, a Christian. You might have been a Christian for 10, 15, 20 years, and yet you don't quite understand how it all happened. And so this is going to help us show us how it happened from start to finish. And I think, again, when we understand that, our God confidence will increase. So here's the first thing. Number one, God gives his chosen ones to Jesus. God gives his chosen ones to Jesus. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Verse 39 says that, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that who? That he has given me. Track down to verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Verse 65. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Church, no one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws them to Jesus. No one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws them to Jesus. The Father gave the Son a certain amount of people for the reward. The Bible calls them chosen ones or the elect. We say, hey, that's not fair. You're right, it's not. What is fair is that no one would be saved by Jesus because no one deserves it, right? But here's how it works. Those whom the Father gives the Son, they come to Jesus. And God doesn't wait around for his chosen ones to come to him. If he did, they would never come. What he does is God the Father draws them to Jesus. Every single one of them God draws to Jesus. Now let's go to the second piece here. Because God gives them to Jesus, they they come to Jesus. They come to Jesus. Verse 37 says that all that the Father gives me will come to me. All that the Father gives me will come to me. So it's not the it's not the other way around. So let's, let me say it the other way around so we can get it. Jesus doesn't say here that because people come to him, then he gives them to God. He doesn't say that, right? It says that all that the Father gives to him, they will most certainly come to Jesus. All that the Father gives the Son come to the Son. He initiates the coming. He initiated it. He guarantees the coming of his own. I'm not sure, again, how you came to know Christ as Lord and Savior, your personal experience, but you need to understand this. When you did, God brought you. (laughs) God brought you. He did it. When Jesus became beautiful to you, it was because God made him beautiful to you. When Jesus became understandable to you, it is because God made him understandable to you. When God opened up your, when, he, when you begin to see Jesus rightly as the Savior of the world, it was because God made you see Jesus as the Savior of the world. We didn't do that on our own. God did this. And when he did, we came freely, wanting to come. God overcame all of our rebellion because we came to Jesus. That's something that we, we should feel very humbled by, by the way, and also hopeful. It should kind of strip away your self-confidence and what you did on that day or whatever you think that you do to deserve it. No, 
God, God brought you to Jesus, and you came because God drew you to Jesus. The third thing is this. Those who are given to Jesus are kept by Jesus. Those who are given to Jesus are kept by Jesus. Look at verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given to me. So, the giving and the coming to Jesus is the sovereign work of the Father. That's what we just said. Now, according to this, the cross and the keeping is the sovereign work of the Son. All that the Father gives to the Son, come to the Son, and when the Son has them, he never loses them. He's the lever of the 99 to save the one. He never loses a single one of us. This is eternal security. That's why it says here that that if we have the Son, we have eternal life. That's forever. That's not temporary life or a possibility at eternal life, right? No, this is eternal life. When God gives you to Jesus and you come to Jesus, you are in the safe hands of Jesus forever. And you can't even lose you. This is how secure you are. Secure in the hands of Jesus because God the Father gave you to Jesus and you can't even lose you. Nothing will separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, right? You can't lose it. This is how secure. You are as secure in Jesus today. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are as secure and sure as God is the God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son is all Jesus. That's how secure we are in Christ. Those the Father gives to the Son are kept by the Son, and none are lost. Not only does the Father give his sons or give, the, give his chosen ones to Jesus, and we come to Jesus and remain eternally safe in the Son, but also, next point, Jesus will raise us up on the last day. Jesus will raise us up on the last day. Look at verse 39. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Verse 40. Everyone who looks upon the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. I think Jesus here repeats this twice about raising up on the last day because I think he knows that sometimes we view death to be final. I think he he thinks we're a people that when we look at death at a funeral or a graveyard or whatever where where we wherever we see the dead, I think he knows in our in our minds we feel that is loss. That is the ultimate uh, loss. It's the end of all things. So here he says two times to remind us that not even on the last day Jesus won't lose anything. He'll raise up. Every single dead believer, that is every uh, corpse in a coffin, and that's even every particle of dust from a cremated body on the last day. Jesus will resurrect them from the dead. Not even a body is lost on the last day. This is incredible good news that gives us a great confidence in the coming good in God. Why does he do all of this? Why does God work salvation like this? Why does he work it 
his sovereign plan? Why does he draw people to Jesus and they come to Jesus and they're kept by Jesus and Jesus raises them up on the last day? Why does he do all of that? Well, the last point here will tell us this. It's because the will of God will never fail. The will of God will never fail. Let me show you here three times. Verse 38 says, For I have come down from heaven, this is Jesus, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Verse 39 says it again, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Verse 40 says it again. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is God's sovereign will to give his own to Jesus, that they come to Jesus. None of his own will be cast out and kept forever by Jesus, that he will raise them up from the dead on the very last day. All of these things are as safe and secure. Why? Because of the will of God will never, ever fail. Nothing will stop him from accomplishing this. Nothing will stop him from accomplishing these things for his own. The will of God is the safest place in the world. Look at Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. It says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Church, I think there's some things for us to process. I think if you understand these things, that God chose you, not because you were good or bad or because of what family you came from or because he saw any good or bad that you were going to do, but just God chose you because of his grace alone and that God drew you to Jesus and that you came to Jesus and Jesus is keeping you and all of these things and he's promised to raise you up on the very last day. Not even your body will be lost. I think understanding these things, if God is doing these things for us, will he not do all things for us in the in-between? If, he's, if we can have a confidence that he's done this, I can have confidence in him today until the very, very end. If he's done the greater thing, will he not do all of the lesser things in the in-between, right? He is to be trusted and nothing will stop him from accomplishing his good and purposeful plan for your life. This is how secure we are. And no matter what happens today and no matter what happens tomorrow, We always, Christians always have a reason for hope. Always. Psalm 42, 5 through 6. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him. My salvation and my God. I think 1 Peter 1 also is a great summary passage of what we've studied today. So I want to read this as well. 1 Peter 1, let's read it. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again. He caused it, we didn't. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, 
may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the living hope that we have, church. Let me address a couple of questions as we close that might be in the room today. Number one, some of you might be saying, how can I know if I am among the chosen? How, how can I know if I'm among the one that God has given to the Son? How do I know? It's a good question. How do I know that he's going to save me? How do I know he's going to keep me to the very end, raise me up on the last day? How do I know if I'm one of these people? Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. It's found in verse 35. And Jesus says this, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never first. So how do you know? You come to Jesus like this. It's just if, have you come to Jesus like this? Hungry? Thirsty? Thirsty for forgiveness? Thirsty for righteousness? Thirsty for God? If you come to Jesus like that, humble, hungry for the bread of life, the soul's drink and the soul's food, if you come to Jesus, that's how you know. That is how you know that the God has given you to the Son and you come to the Son. And the Son will keep you and raise you up on the very last day. That's how you know. You just have to come to Jesus hungry and thirsty. So have you ever done that in your life? Do you know Jesus is your soul satisfaction? He's the only source of hope in your life? If you do, you are. <laughs> you are. If you're unsure, the invitation is clear. You can come today. <laughs> come to him today. Eat and drink to your soul's delight. Right? Right? It's all you got to do. Just come to Jesus. You have to come to Jesus because apart from Jesus, there is no hope for you. There's no hope. There's just life and then you die forever. It's a hopeless, hopeless life and existence without the hope of Jesus. But he gives hope to the most hopeless of all sinners like me and like you. You just got to come to him. For those who do know, you know these truths about Jesus and the hope that you have in him. Let me close with a few questions, that reflective questions that you might ask yourself today. Uh, the first one is this. Are you a hopeful person? Are you a hopeful person? Do you find yourself, a measurable, I think, maybe not all, but a measurable might be. Do you find yourself talking a lot more about what's wrong in the world, what's wrong in your life, and maybe even talking about what's wrong in the church? Do you find yourself doing a lot of that more than talking about the goodness of God in the world, the goodness of God in your life? And the goodness of God in the church. Do you find yourself doing those things? That's how you tell if you're a hopeful person. Hopeful people you know, don't mean they don't point out wrong. Right? That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying their life is not dominated by negativity and pessimism. Do you have the hope of God in you? If you do, you'll be a hopeful person. Be a hopeful person. Here's another question. Do you show that you have confidence in God by obeying his commands because you believe that obedience is better than disobedience? So that's one of the ways you show that you have this 
confident expectation of a coming good based upon the promises and person of God is you just obey his word. You follow his commands. If you don't obey those things and you disobey God, you really don't have a confident expectation that God's doing something good in your life. The way that you show you have hope, a God confidence, is by obeying him because it's securing a greater good by being obedient to Jesus. Here's another one. Do you show hope to others in a hopeless world? You know, we have this responsibility as the church to be distribution centers of hope to a hopeless world. We're not this private membership club of hope to fortress ourselves away from a dark, hopeless world. No, we're called to be distribution centers and get out into the world and share the gospel of hope with people. And listen, all I know is that God has drawn some people to himself to Jesus. They're out there. I don't know who they are, and neither do you. But that's not my, that's not my job. My job is to share. Your, your job is to share the good news of hope and leave the results to God. But we are called to be beacons of hope out into the world, to show other lost people. Some people here, uh, some Christians, they have a great understanding of hope. But they don't know their neighbors. There's no one in their life that's even lost. Not trying to show hope to anyone. They just, I got the, I got the hope. I'm good. I'll get to heaven. That's not why God gave us hope. It's not why He began to do all of the work of drawing us to Jesus and all. It's so we would be beacons of hope to the world. Are you being a hopeful person? In a hopeless world. Church, we have the hope of God inside of us. And that is a strong and mighty thing. Let me pray for us. Father, we bless your name. And we thank you for your truth. And God, helping us understand how you saved us today. Father, I pray that we work through question marks and, and difficulties and doubts. And God, we would see a greater thing in this, in this text and through your word that says that our salvation is safe and secure and our confidence is in you because you are a never lying, never losing God who always wins. Make us a people that have such an incredible God confidence in the world, secure your people. Work in your people. God, today, draw some to yourself. The bread is offered. Your son, Jesus, is the bread of life. And I, God, I pray if anyone is here today who does not know Jesus as this bread from heaven, that they would come today and they would hunger and thirst no more. Father, we lift up all of these things to you because you're the only one that can do it. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.